There's no other variables of time other than the time a particle of light leaves the sun and hits the earth. If you understand physics and space, and people try to give a spatial relation, and I'm talking about outer space, I'm talking a spatial relationship in a quantum sense of physics, there's so many variables involved, we get confused and then we have no process of quantifying our progress. You see, with time, you can quantify anything. Well, how do you quantify guilt, Dave? Tell me how often you feel guilty today. 62 minutes, good. Try being guilty 61 minutes tomorrow and quantitatively you've made progress in the right trajectory. I use time. If we use space, it'd be very difficult to figure out guilt. I'm not smart enough, but I know mathematically you could because those are the only two quantitative devices or things that we can use time and space to measure. But there's too many variances in space. There's none in time. Particle of light to the earth. Everyone has that same dependent variable. And we can improve upon ourselves by using that. Next question, yeah. Zach, CEO, co-founder of WeFlyer. Um, Great company, by the way. Yeah, I actually been thinking a lot about kind of what you brought up about like 24 hours in your day of optimizing and maximizing and kind of come to the conclusion that like you really only do two out of three things well of like your business, you're taking care of yourself and like your social and family life. And it's and then you sometimes foster guilt over like sacrificing one of those three. And then also tripping into just like optimizing the twelve hours or fifteen hours that I dedicate to work that so much of it ends up being, I, I kind of isolated, is like communication debt, dealing with communication debt between the different parties in, the, in my company, you know, product team, advisors, investors, social team, all of that, that I just spend 12 hours of my day just on Zooms, like telling the same thing to different people, and I don't know if there's any even kind of more <laughs> practical advice sure. that you have from leading large organizations about like just how to handle, like as you start to scale, you know, in the early days, I was wearing a lot of hats too, and pretty much everything myself. Now I have a team of people, and I'm managing these people, and I'm trying sure. to just get the best out of them. And like, I don't know if there's anything. So from your experience there's two pragmatic that. issues here, and these are very helpful. So, if we take ourselves out of the reactionary, I'm telling ten different people the exact same thing, or I'm utilizing my time in an inefficient manner through doing things that are not maximizing where I think I want to be in business or activity I get paid for. I take a step back and tell myself, what if I spend my time teaching people values? What if I spend my time teaching people a execution practice and a execution model to those practices? So for me, I spend Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a minimum of an hour on Monday, minimum of 15 minutes on Wednesday, minimum of an hour on Friday, two hours on Friday, so I do my trainings for my entire team, teaching four values that are empowering to make those decisions so that you're practicing as well the way to make better decisions aligned with where we want to be, and you know where we want to be, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So. Gratitude, you're, we're all gonna have the same perspective. We're looking for the light, the love, and the lessons. Forgiveness, we're all extremely aggressive in making mistakes and improving. Accountability, taking into account how we learn through being responsible for what we've done, attracting what we've done, and participating in a certain perception of what we've done. And then executing my model based on capturing the opportunities, distributing the opportunities, prioritizing the opportunities, executing on the opportunities, or redistributing it so someone else can prioritize internally or externally. That's the model that, that I have. And in the context of being confident that I don't have to tell you, I've taught you how I think how I do, and how I execute. And you'll learn more because you're not just trying to be me, you're gonna tell me mistakes. How do, I have a different model of scaling a business and it's guaranteed to work. It just takes a, a lot of uh, overcoming fear. First of all, anyone you hire is an investment. You can't, like, I see so many companies fail because they bring someone in and then 
they immediately want to return on an investment they haven't made. They're, they want to return on investment someone else has made. Doesn't make any sense to me. So if you don't and can't figure out, in my company it's 90 days, hey, I'm gonna spend 50 grand in the, in the first 90 days by you shadowing me, and while you shadow me, I want you to give me suggestions on where you come from, how I can get better, and I want you to ask me questions on why I did things the way I did them for 90 straight days. I don't want you to, I don't want any return on my investment. And I'm willing to spend $50,000 for 90 days on you to figure that out. Then you're gonna work with me. And now that's break even time. So I'll spend, whether it's 180 or 360 days, you know, that same $15,000 a month, and we're gonna make that money back together. But after that period, I'm just gonna supervise you to see how much I can bring out of you, how much I can mentor you, teach you, and coach you. Mentoring is giving you the steps to where I think I am, teaching is explaining how I got there, and coaching is bringing the best out of you that has nothing to do with me, your skills, your knowledge, your desire. And after I'm here, now I can scale my business because I'll make another $50,000 investment for you to do it and I'll take on my own. And pretty soon I'll have four and then eight and then 16 and then 32. That's how you get to 10,000 employees yeah. successfully. Teaching values, execution, model practices. So I teach the values, the daily practice, every single meeting. Do I ask them to tell me these things? But I don't, I don't have to, but while I'm working with Nick, I might say, I'll give you an example. Subtleties of success. I have, you know, like any guy that fly, flies or travels a lot, I get four o'clock checkout. So I thought, okay, cool. I'm gonna do this, I have a show to do. So I'm gonna run back to the hotel and do my show and then go to the airport. So I told Nick, good morning, make sure we have a four o'clock checkout. They're like, sorry, your room is booked. So you have to leave at 1230. I told Nick, you know what, next time when we check in, let's make sure we're in a room that doesn't have someone checking into it. That little subtle thing, now luckily there's a good place to do a show, not, but I could ruin my whole, and it snowballs from there. We've had all types of different things, but that doesn't occur by me telling him what to do. It's working and collaborating and learning together. Hey, you mind repeating, I just never heard it broken down so beautifully. Different than how you said from uh, mentorship, yes, teaching, and coaching. So, yeah, and these, especially today with this personal development phase, which I love because it's activity I get paid for and I become more and more valuable the older I get. So, I love anything that you can do in life that you're more valuable the older you get. Yeah, yeah, right. That's the thing that sucks about being an NFL star. It's not gonna happen, right? <laughs> so, that's Tom Brady, and he's the best I know. So there's three things that people need today. Mentorship is people that you tell them, right? You're in a position they want to be in, you give them directions to where you are. Just tell them this is how, and you know, this is how I got to where I am. That's mentorship. The teaching is the ability to teach someone how to take those steps in order to get there. That's my most challenging part. Some people like my mom, amazing teacher, terrible mentor, but also she's an amazing coach. And a coach, and you look at the greatest athletes in the world, and I've been around those guys, and it always amazed me who was coaching them. Because some of them couldn't hold a candle to what they were. And then you had guys like my business partner, Warren Moon, who told me I'm not a good coach. I'm a good mentor for, I could tell people how I threw a football or how, but I'm not a good teacher or coach. So when Cam Newton came to us and said, you know, David, I want you to represent us. And Warren, I want you to teach me how to be the best quarterback like you. Warren's like, I can't, I, I, but a coach brings the best out of you. That's my favorite part of mentorship. So I'm a natural mentor because I, I learned lessons along the way. I'm a natural coach because I've been coached. That was my superpower. I, People were able to get the best out of very little talent. And then I've learned to be a teacher from my mom, mentoring me how she teaches. Because I'm impatient, 
I haven't paid attention at the level. I mean, you have to pay real attention to teach someone. That's why I love my people all mentoring people, teaching and coaching people. Because if you get to the point where you can teach someone, coach them and mentor them, you know your shit. So what are some of the signs of that 90 day person that you invested in? Yeah. Of them not being the right person? Like what do you do after 90 days Perfect. if they're not the right person? I, so number one, before they're hired, they know they have 90 days. I reevaluate everything right? after 90 days. Yeah, and they, and they know that. And they also know that if they're not a good fit, if their skills, knowledge, and desire are not aligned with the trajectory of where we think we want to be as a business, then I'm going to help them find a place as well. So I'm not the cutthroat, fire fast, see you later alligator. I, I know a ton of people and I'm like, whoa, this person would be super good at this. I just don't have a job that needs someone to be super good at that. Right? And so for me, I'm looking at how well... But you're not compromising mission no because, because not the right fit. You're gonna get him somewhere else yeah send him other way. I, I i always look at skills knowledge desire according to knowing my values like if after 90 days i say to you uh like nick right he's been more than 90 days nick what are my four values i mean you really know after two weeks right because i will get kids you know in positions where i'll say hey what's my four values um and, and I tell them when they start, when I want you to learn four values, it has to be quantum in your nature. I don't want you to memorize them. I, I'm going to ask you after 90 days, not only what are the four values, and I may ask you at an impromptu moment when chaos is happening, because then I know it's quantum. Like Nick's doing something else right now, I know it's quantum because he was focused in on emails and stuff that he's supposed to be doing, right? But if they can't do it, then I'm like, shit, I have no hope here. It's been 90 days, yeah. and the priority that I've given you, or maybe it's in the daily practices. They just don't get prioritization. If you can't prioritize, you're just going to be overwhelmed and procrastinate. I don't care how much skill or knowledge you have. If you are feel overwhelmed and procrastinate, you're not going to fit in. You're not going to be productive, accessible, and gracious. And then on the execution model, if you're not putting things into Notion, or you're not, it's not going to work because we're collaborative, coordinated system and if you're not following the systems then we're it, the loss is going to be so much greater it's not going to change after 90 days awesome right, now, quick question yes sir really valuable don't plan for what could be plan for what is and that's really helped me this week that was just for monday how can i focus more on what is as opposed to all the could be yeah, so I, this is where that brand, the Ferocious Buddha comes, because I see this as the biggest difficult challenge that people face is reconciling what I call today with the future and today with outcomes. Like, it's just so hard for, for our human nature to put in the work and to allow an outcome. It's, it's so hard. Press. I it's face it. It's energetic and genetic in our inheritance to attach our success, emotion to the outcome, especially if we bust our balls, no pun intended. Yeah. Like if you put everything into it, it's the best ingredients for why me yeah. when it doesn't happen the way you want it to be. I'm going to repeat that. When you put everything into it, it's the perfect ingredient for why me for I wanted it to be. And that's why you'll hear me say, I'm on a trajectory of where I think I want to be or better. And I think the most valuable lesson in my bankruptcy throughout the time of, you know, I meet like m most successful people like Brad and who's like, shit, man, I, I, I've been there day, but I haven't lost that much. Right. Well, what comes with that is like, if you can realize from failing to meet the expectation of an outcome that you desired, that's what failure is, a failure to meet the expectation with the outcome that I desired. There is no failure. Now, people throw that around. Oh, there's no failure. Yes, there is. If you don't have a cognizant understanding or awareness that your failure was to meet the expectation of the outcome you desired with what happened. That's why even by vocalizing, this is what I want or better. Now, was it challenging and I wasn't in this mindset 15 years ago? Was it challenging 
to go up to my mom's house to tell her I was bankrupt and I lost her house because I didn't take my name off the title. That was an outcome that was very, very far from the amount of effort I put into taking care of my mom and buying her a house, right? I, I put everything into doing that. But 15 years later, I was protected and promoted. My mom was fine. My mom wasn't even worried, right? But I wasn't fine. I, I was on a trajectory of dying, losing my wife. That, that's what would have happened but for the outcome that I thought was so far from what I wanted. But what it was, was it was an outcome that I wanted or better. I just was using man-made linear time to evaluate an instant of an activity saying, oh, can't believe I got to move. I got to move my mom. I can't believe I got to start over. But as I told Brad today, I was like, but then again, you know, people tell me I lost my only $10,000 and went bankrupt. And I said, that's different than where I was. What was the first thing you did to start over? Well, first of all, got out of bed. Huh? Got out of bed was the first thing. I, I, I literally came up with this philosophy. The first five minutes suck. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was lucky that Rocky came on and I have it videotaped on my phone, the, the TV, because I sat there going, holy shit, he's taking a beating. And they're telling him, stay down, because that's the way I felt. We just got up. You can look up, you can get up, first five minutes suck, lower the bar. If it has to be lowered to the point where I'm just going to get up, then, because that's all Rocky did in that movie. He didn't win. He just said, I'm just going to get up. I'm just going to get up, and we'll see what happens from there. No rematch, <laughs> right? And then you got Rocky Nine. Think about it. Because he got up. And Creed Seven. And Creed Seven, right. <laughs> right. But honestly, think about it. So for me, the two things for me is understanding motivation versus inspiration. When you get your ass kicked, it takes motivation to get up, inspiration to get you there to be in spirit. Motivation is like rocket fuel. It will get you up, but it ain't gonna get you there. It'll wear you down. It's because fear is a motivating component. Fear is not an inspirational component. But, so I limit it by saying, okay, first five minutes suck. I can quit after five minutes. Notice time once again is my dependent variable. And I can't tell you how many workouts start with, okay, I'm gonna quit after five minutes if this still sucks. I've never quit once. I've never ended one of my hours of working out and said, man, I wish I didn't do that. And I have been in really challenging places thinking I don't want to do this. First my finish suck. It's just a lowering the bar, motivating, inspirational getting me there. Thank you. Yes, I sure. Know, you were talking about hiring. I just want to ask you, what is it that, what do you believe that you can do or what are you doing to attract new talent? Yes. And So hiring, what are you doing to attract talent? And what are those people looking for? Yeah, what is it that people are looking for? Yeah, so first of all, don't, number one, you're always hiring. Yeah. That doesn't mean you actually have to go to contract. <laughs> yeah. Like, why, I don't understand why people aren't always looking. Like, I'm looking for someone to replace Nick right now. And he's not nervous. Because when I'm looking for to replace Nick right now, I'm looking to see where Nick falls compared to what's out there. And I can put Nick in a better position when I have someone that can do what Nick does. Because he knows my values, daily practices, and execution model, and I know I'm limiting his skills, knowledge, and desire. So I gotta, someone's gonna have to do that too. So I'm, I'm always- happy when they're growing. Right, and I'm always, and it's okay if you're growing outside. I just, uh, Jake, who's my right-hand man, probably one of the most charismatic kids I've ever met, not the most organized, but he started his own speaking bureau and podcast agency and took me on as a client. Mm. But he felt so guilty and scared and all this. I'm like, dude, you're 26 years old. You've been with me since you've been at Michigan. What do you think you're going to grow that type of skill set just dealing with David Meltzer? No. But the number one way to recruit talent is to retain it. 
So I'm always, I'm always recruiting and hiring, but I'm spending my, and I learned this from Lee Steinberg, it's a great story. We went up to UCLA and there's a cornerback, he ended up being a, a Hall of Famer, uh, e Eastley, I think, maybe not a Hall of Famer, but extremely good, Kenny Eastley, played for UCLA. So we're in Orange County, we recruit everyone from UCLA and USC that we can, because they're in our backyard, especially skilled players, because they're higher paid. And so I go on campus with Lee, and Kenny's a senior. And Lee walks up to him, and he's like literally off of the Jerry Maguire movie. So everybody wants to talk to Lee Steinberg, which is a huge advantage in being a sports agent. And he walks up, and Kenny, he's like, hey, Kenny, can I talk to you? You know, I'd really like to represent you. And Kenny said, fuck you, Kenny. I fuck you, Lee. And Lee's like, whoa. What did I do? He said, I've been here four years. I'm now a senior and I'm a first round draft pick and now you want to represent me? What kind of bullshit is that? These guys have been chasing me since I've been a freshman. Now the great Lee Steinberg wants to represent me? And Lee said, yeah. He said, because while these other idiots were spending their time recruiting you when you couldn't be recruited, I was taking care of the clients that I had. And if you want an agent that's gonna take care of you and pay attention to you, after you're drafted and get you more deals and get you more money, then you should have me represent you. But if you want a guy who's gonna go chase the next freshman, sophomore and junior that can't be recruited and not pay attention to you, then go with you. There's a reason Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Warren Moon, Bruce Smith, Thurman Thomas, all are represented by us. Because I pay attention to them still, not out here at UCLA sucking your ass when you can't be recruited. And he walked away. Guess who called immediately? Yeah. Ken Eastley. That's what I do. I, do. I recruit all the time by taking care and retaining Nick or taking care of people who want to move on and I help them find a better place, a better position, a better situation. Because remember, at Assessment, if you're going to take one lesson away from you today, especially with social media, especially with like Gary was talking about, Hermosi talks about it in different ways. I have simplified my life. I want this to be my life. I want to build a community of people that want to help each other and know people that can help each other. And I want to do my best to help you and know people that can help you. Whether you work with me or have activity that I pay you for, whether you're in my family, whether you're a friend, it's real simple. Hey, would it help you if, do you know anyone that can help me? The objective of my conversations is to figure out, would it help you if, or do you know anyone that can help me? Why? We've never had, like Gary said, for free, the ability to build a community of people that are willing to help each other and know people that can help each other. Because the greatest companies in the world, the greatest families in the world are these type of communities because this is what these communities do. And I've simplified it in a business context. A community of people that help each other and know people that help each other, they do two things that create huge success. One, they buy from you. Two, they sell for you. The bigger your community of people that are buying from you and selling for you, you will be everything you desire or better. It's that simple. And the only way to do it is to be more interested, hate to be a record, than interesting by finding out what are you doing today, what do you like, what don't you like, will it help you if, and by the way, do you know anyone that can help me? You show me one successful person, one successful building business, they have people that are buying from them and selling for them. For free. That's, that's what, how you get to having over a billion people. That's exactly my mission, right? And, and we make it so hard. I, I try my best to create real frameworks that you can make your own of identifying fear, stopping, dropping, rolling, five daily practices, but make them your own. But do them. Yeah. The yeah, that's a, do it. Right, and Warren I know is on my student of the calendar. He's like one of my best students of the student of the calendar. And it's so fun to see him every that's week. That's what I focus on. Yeah, and I he's- have, I haven't figured it out. I'm going to get this. And I'm, try, I'm trying to get there. But the subtleties you see, I talked about uh, Bob Parsons today down there with the Silicon Slopes people, right? I'm in this interview and it just, it's, Listen to this because it's so powerful. So Bob Parsons interviewing, he's 70 something. He sold his portion of GoDaddy was 4 billion, right? Vietnam vet, 
PTSD. He's an amazing guy. But, you know, he's in his 70s, so I'm interviewing him. He's like, well, you know, Dave, if you love what you do, and I, you can see me on the video, I roll my eyes. Like, please don't, please don't say it, right? If you love what you do, I'd say it in my head, right? You'll never work a day. And I'm like, and he shocks me with probably, I think, one of the deepest statements I've ever heard. He said, you know, Dave, if you love what you do, it'll tell you all its secrets. It will tell, it will you, tell all you all its secrets. And that's when it hit me. I had to stop the interview because I'm like, oh, fuck. If you want your life to be simple, then get all the cheat codes. There's only one way to bring attention to the coincidences you want. Having your own values, your own daily practices, and your own execution model. Execution model. And I personally think you need to know your incentives every day. My incentives every day are to create abundance. In business, it's called sales. So I'm incentivized to create revenue. Two, to be honest with myself. To ask for help and ask questions. To be a student of my calendar, to be productive, accessible, and gracious with my time. And then finally, to be accessible and engaged in my life. It's, it's not enough anymore to be engaged. It's, you know, I think Gallup had a poll, over 85% of the people have limited engagement in the activity they get paid for. I think you have to be accessible to it because we work remote, we, and, and we haven't caught up the people who are making business decisions of how productive you can be with technology. So we have a whole bunch of people lying to themselves and lying to us about how productive they can be because they're getting 10 times as much done in one tenth the time. And so they're taking on three and four jobs, they're doing, trying to build the side hustle, they're just, they're not people can do, especially these young people. So you have to make sure they're engaged and accessible. Find the light, the love, and the lessons. That's why gratitude, learn to love, learn to love. I, I have that beginning of my video usually, I have like six different videos before I speak, but it always starts out with, do you think that I love selling legal research? No, I learned to love it. Just like I learned to love practicing football because I wanted to be the best that I could be. Now, did I do it out of fear and separation that I wanted to prove something to somebody that nobody in my family had ever been even close to an athlete and everyone had been Harvard summa cum laude's and you know I literally I'm not lying if I went to a family reunion and said well yeah I graduated Harvard in 90 and was summa cum laude and got into Harvard med school my family literally be like oh that's awesome but when I went to a family reunion and said I played college football what it was like holy shit you did what no, no, really. You played. Yeah, yeah, I played. I literally could have said I was Harvard summa cum laude, Harvard med school, and they'd be like, hey, you know, good. That's what, we expect that out of you. But understanding why we do things in the trajectory of what we do. Uh, one more question. So Jim said you are only going to retain, how much did he say? You'll lose 80%. I say you're going to lose 95 and eventually 100. So how do we retain information? Tony Robbins is coming up. He's at the highest level of being able to sell tickets as a speaker and impact people as a speaker. It's a rarity on earth. We get one or the other usually or varying degrees of it. It's one of my aspirations is I had to focus on this side to get to this side. This side takes a long time. I know some super impactful speakers that are down here, right? I'm trying to, but Tony Robbins is here on both, in my opinion. So how do we retain information? What I've learned is a system to retain information, the right information. Knowing that eventually we will retain zero, what I do is I create a system to capture information with one criteria, that which resonates with me. Not everything and not nothing. I know those are the majority camps out there. I'm gonna write down everything, you're gonna end up with zero. I'm gonna write down nothing or capture, because we have iPads and everything, sorry, I'm old. Uh, nothing, you end up with zero. 
But if you create a system to capture information, nuggets, lessons that resonate with you, devoid of time, and then create a system to access that information when the time is right, you will retain 100% of what you were supposed to have in order to effectuate statistical success for the future. When, you know, when I have an intuitive lesson like Bob Parsons, right, that one resonated with me immediately. I had to capture myself first because like all my mind wanted to do was go down that rabbit hole and I didn't have, I had to finish the interview and I was at the Super Bowl and there's a lot of other activity. So I stopped and I said, Bob, repeat that again, please. And then I pointed to Jake and I said, if you love what you do, it'll tell you all the secrets. Jake captured on his cell phone. Jake then text messaged me that one nugget. Reposited. I then texted it to my email. It went into my lessons folder in my email, which becomes searchable. And then on Sundays, I recategorize all the lessons that resonated with me for a week into different categories so that if I write a book or have a speech according to the topic or subject matter, I can quickly access that. I then create a story around it about Bob Parsons and you know I make it colorful with the old man thing and I elevate his credibility by saying not only did he sell his company for four billion personally, but he also was a Vietnam vet with PTSD. These are all intentional things that I do. It, it's, it's not preparing, it's understanding a system in order to effectuate when is that gonna be important. To finish up, the best, I think, example of this is I have this studio at the Wynn. So I get to go to the Wynn and I do these interviews and I always take a break and I'll walk through the casino to learn human nature because human nature never changes. And one of the things I love about human nature watching the craps table is there's always a guy at the craps table that will throw a hard eight. And he always says the same thing. Yes, I knew it. <laughs> What's really happening there? He gets an intuitive thought that hard eight is gonna be rolled. Now, the universe, which is an Akashic record, it's a system of frequencies and information floating around us, it doesn't know man-made constructive time. So when people are predicting the end of the earth because you know Nostradamus or the Akashic records or whatever, it's complete bullshit if you know physics because time's a man-made construct. So if someone says something's gonna happen in 2011, or what was a Orwell's 2000 and... I encounter any... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Because that's a man-made construct. That's not a universal construct. So when this person gets an intuitive thought, hey, I'm raising your awareness to hard eight. That doesn't mean the next role is gonna be hard eight. They're two separate things. I'm not saying don't capture it. If you want to sit there and play the odds and increase your odds, yes, it is an increase in the odds that a hard eight will be coming in the future. But if you stop playing in 40 minutes, that doesn't mean the minute you leave that it doesn't have six hard eights, which is why when you watch people leave the roulette table, they're like, holy shit, I've been betting double zero for the last six rolls and I just left. No shit because the universe is raising your awareness to double zeros, you just can't guarantee the time. Yeah. So, but with lessons, we can hold lessons for life because life is about lessons. The lessons keep on coming and pain's the indicator that you have a lesson to learn. So what happens is when pain occurs in my life, I go into my vault of lessons according to the subject matter of the awareness that was resonating with me at the time the pain comes. Therefore, elevating my statistical success of quickly learning lessons applicable to an interference to that lesson or the trajectory I want to be on. Oh no, I have a vault of lessons. Not only, it, initially it's just literally into one box every week and then Sundays I distribute it by subject matter, especially if I'm writing a book and it falls into one of those. And then I go back and I notate Bob Parsons' story about you know, at Super Bowl. Because the way my human mind works, kind of like what Jim was teaching, is I, if I scripted every single lesson and the stories that were attached, 
I'd be dead. But I know that the jacket story, which is one of his favorites, so I have a notation about you can't take anything with you when you're gone. And next to it's a notation that says jacket story. I have told that jacket story to Adam 10 times. He cries every time. And it's told a different way because it's not scripted. And to be honest, I can't remember exactly how it happened, so I'm just telling what I think happened to what? Illustrate the lesson that my dad was trying to teach me money can't buy you happiness, you can't take anything with you when you're gone, I'm worried about you, you're just like me, which then I've creatively tied into another story when my wife was gonna leave me to say the epiphany of my life was seeing that jacket and realizing that I didn't hate my mom, my dad, my best friend, and my wife, I hated myself. I was the liar, the cheater, the manipulator, overseller, back-end seller that I accused my dad of being when he gave me that jacket to elevate my awareness to a genetic and energetic inheritance that would destroy me. And I've never told that story that way. But I've told the same lesson a hundred times. And I also, just to end up, and then we'll take a picture. When you become a speaker or you want to be a coach, you're going to be afraid of one thing, being repetitive. Just remember this, if you think that your lessons are repetitive and everyone's already heard this and those that have heard this are going to think you're boring, remember this. Why have you watched your favorite movie like Rudy or Hoosiers or Rocky a hundred times? Why when you're little do you tell your grandpa or grandma, read me Brown Bear? Read, sing me that song. When I go to the Rolling Stones, which I just went to for whatever amount of times, the first thing I said when I walked into my suite was, they better play Satisfaction. <laughs> Why is that? I've heard that goddamn song so many times. So understand human nature and don't inhibit yourself from teaching and repeating the best lessons, the best songs, the best stories that you know. People will only be more attracted to you, not less. They'll see more value in you, not less by sticking to the things that you know have helped you and add value to others. All right, everyone, thank you guys so much. Can we take one picture?